Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, wherever in the world you may be. Uh, I'm Michael Medellin. I am the Director of Engineering for a software engineering unit inside the Air Force called Kessel Run. Uh, and joining me today is Gordon, who I'll let introduce himself. Hi folks, um, my name is Gordon Tillman. I'm a Principal Engineer with F9 and have been working with Kessel Run for almost a year now. Awesome, thank you, Gordon. Today, uh, we're gonna spend about 20, 25 minutes or so talking to everyone about how the Department of Defense is using Kubernetes and Flux uh, to achieve our compliance and deployment consistency that we're looking for um, in our efforts to de develop um, uh, the capabilities that our users are looking from us from us on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, just you know, I, you know, coming into context, I want to make sure I can explain a bit more about what Kessel Run is and what we're doing. Um, our vision is to deliver combat capability that can sense and respond to conflict in any domain, any time, and anywhere. Uh, we are part of the mission just as much as uh, the exercises and operations that go on with flying planes around the world or flying aircraft or, or, or um, you know driving aircraft carriers around the world. Uh, we are we are building the capability necessary for the airmen and women uh, who ser who serve the United States and our coalition partners uh, to win the next war. And the software teams, both myself and Gordon, on uh, the teams that that is working on the platform, and also our application teams who take a dependency on our work, uh, are shipping that software uh, every day to our users around the world. So we want to take a time to to kind of just brief you a little bit on Kessel and, and and that mission overall. Um, so if you dive into it, what really is Kessel Run? Uh, Kessel Run is an acquisition development environment. So uh, traditionally within the government, um, we have acquisition units that are going out and, and uh, awarding contracts to uh, software engineering teams and other teams to, and other companies to actually build capability, much like you would go out and build um, an airplane or a ship or some, some type of capability or, or for the Department of Defense uh, we would be acquiring that and we are part of that acquisitions uh, uh, infrastructure for the Department of Defense. But uh, internally, we are very much a software engineering organization. Um, you know, in, in kind of the buzzwordy term, we're, we're, we're doing DevSecOps. We're trying to unify a way to ship software to our users around the world, um, do it securely, do it reliably, and do it continuously and kind of achieving that loop. Uh, so a bit more about kind of Kessel Run's mission and kind of what's our our main focus from a you know what what we're what are we actually trying what, who are what's our mission what are we actually trying to solve um, and, and, and you know I, I we have to talk a bit more about kind of the Air Operations Center and how we do command and control operations for the United States Air Force and our coalition forces around the world. Um, back when this, you know, when the Air Force is kind of first started, this was a very much manual process, uh, working with maps, communicating over radios and telephones to, to direct uh, resources and, and, and manpower to actually uh, affect capability around the world uh, based on the mission that we were being asked to serve. Um, naturally, over time, this got this became more software driven. So. Uh, in the 1990s, you saw the introduction of computers and, and digital technology to help coordinate resources. This is very much kind of a, a normal enterprise resource planning problem. It's like, how do you get people and in, in, in air assets to the location uh, best necessary to suit, suit the mission and actually execute the mission? Um, and as of today, this, this is more digitally driven, right? So we've got these legacy systems that our, our, our users around the world, air, airmen and air women are are, are accessing these applications, conducting missions, conducting planning and execution, um, but they're using these systems that were developed so long ago uh, by by engineering teams that weren't, uh, you know, what we call what would be familiar to us as kind of a modern quote unquote DevSecOps engineering environment, shipping software quickly, uh, iteratively to our users on a day to day basis to uh, to prove out. Uh, the capability and deliver what's ne most necessary and important at that point in time uh, when we deliver it. So I think it's worth kind of defining the problem a bit more so, to, so folks have an understanding of the problem space that we're working with. So we kind of got the mission laid out. We're trying to solve the command and control problem for our users who are around the world. But if we if we step back a bit, you know, actually delivering that command and control capabilities is actually fairly difficult. 
Um, we have a globally distributed user base and, and, and by distributed, it's, it's fairly evenly distributed. We have users and, and operations that happen around the world uh, at all the different COCOMs that we need to be able to support with all of the operations and capability that we're shipping. Um, we have multiple air gap networks that we have to support. So dealing with deploying our clusters and our applications and our services and configuration, uh, do, controlling all that configuration, controlling all of that deployment uh, uniformly across all of these networks that are air gapped is a very difficult challenge and sort of leads us to kind of some of the solutions that we're going to be talking about a bit later on in the presentation. We also have to support commercial and on-prem infrastructure. We're using commercial cloud. We're using our own you know, gl globally distributed on-premise infrastructure that we need to be able to support, that we're putting Kubernetes clusters on, that we're putting applications and services on and distributing that workload around the world to be able to serve the mission. We also need to be able to support on-demand operational and exercise and test environments. There's always exercises and tests being conducted with our software that we don't want to we don't want to kind of battle test our production or operational environments. We actually want to use separate, isolated environments to be able to test and execute exercises uh, without interfering with normal operations and in, in, in an actual real world use case. And finally, uh, where where kind of the title was 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 leading us for this presentation is that. All of this also has a compliance and regulatory challenge as well that I can that I'm going to follow up here a bit on as well. Um, but but really, kind of these five major areas or issues really define the type of complexity and problem that Gordon's team and our teams in in in, in our platform engineering environment are having to solve uh, alongside our application development teams to be able to deliver their capability effectively. Uh, to the end user, to our coalition partners, to the United States Air Force, to conduct missions and operations around the world. And these sets of challenges are, are inform a lot of what we've, we've chosen and selected as part of the technology stack. Diving real quickly in terms of compliance and regulatory, one thing I'd be remiss to mention is that um, the major challenge that we face in this space and kind of where Kessel Run kind of got its original claim to fame, if you will, within the Department of Defense is this idea of that, how can we, we, we improve the ability in which we field what we call as an ATO. Basically, every system or information system inside of the Department of Defense legally needs this authority to operate to be able to take on operational missions, whether it's, uh, you know, managing employee payroll data to actually conducting air missions, uh, all of those systems have to have an authority to operate that we've reduced the risk, we've proven that the model is secure, and that we've done the controls necessary to get to mitigate as much risk as possible before we field this system in production. Uh, and this process is very, very tedious previously. Um, and so it's led us kind of what we call the continuous authority to operate that I'll kind of briefly touch on here. Uh, to set the stage for Gordon to, to talk a bit more about what we're doing with Flux. So traditionally, the ATO uh, was 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 you know you, it's something that you achieved and got you know you 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 achieved your ATO, you earned your ATO in a month to years time frame, depending on the complexity of the system. It's very paperwork driven, very very tedious. Um, major architectural changes were kind of out of the question because it would impact the ATO. But that ATO would kind of last three years, then you revisit the thing uh, every so, you know, at that three year interval to, to either renew the ATO or change the ATO, depending on the circumstances. Obviously, this, this kind of pattern has left to a lot of stagnant, stale systems within the, the different parts of the Department of Defense because not many teams are wanting to actually go about architectural changes and deliver new capability because of that tediousness involved with actually earning that authority to operate. So then, you know, kind of where we are now in this phase one of continuous ATO is that Kessel One kind of pushed the ball forward here and said, we're going to reduce that time to get an ATO down to days and months. We're going to leverage rapid assessment with uh, application security teams and assessment teams. And we're going to implement guardrails and static scanning tools to help provide and identify vulnerabilities in our code bases before we actually ship them to production. And we're going to leverage best practice commercial products, products in our in our founding, things like Pivotal Cloud Foundry to help ship software quicker and more uniformly across our environments. 
And now kind of where we're going in this transition around Kubernetes and containers and, and declarative infrastructure is kind of what I think of as phase two as our continuous authority to operate. How can we, how can Kessel Run take what it did originally in pushing the bounds of the continuous authority to operate forward and do the next best thing and the next great thing for application security, DevSecOps and the DOD. And this is kind of what we're, we're, we're talking about today. How can we reduce it from, from days to months to ship code to production, but in hours or days, how can you show up on your, on your first day to Kessel Run and, and submit a bug change uh, to production in that same day? How can you how can we use techniques like policy as code and configuration management tools like Flux and 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 other types of GitOps patterns to help drive the types of compliance and and configuration management uh, expectations that we have in the platform for our customers and our authorizing officials um, on the platform? Uh, can we leverage open source tool chains, products like Kubernetes, products like uh, Flux in our tool stack to help? enable more transparency and more security within our infrastructure because I'm fully in, you know, on board with being able to leverage open battle tested systems that have had you know, security and open penetration testing and vulnerability assessments. How can we leverage more of open source contributions in our system and actually and then turn uh, contribute back to the open source community uh, as we kind of move forward down this path because not only do we want to actually leverage what the community has done, but actually take what we're learning and operating in these complex environments and contribute back to tools like Flux and, and Kubernetes to help improve uh, the direction and capabilities of those systems to support not only our complex environments, but other, other others in the community who face similar challenges. So Gordon and I work on what's the applicate the, the platform team. So we work on what we call the all domain common platform, and we're trying to make it easy for teams to ship secure, reliable, resilient software. Um, and defining this a bit more, we're building a multi-network, a multi-region hybrid infrastructure platform that helps solve these problems for our application team so that they can stay focused on the mission outcomes and we can solve the operational complexities for these teams that require supporting multiple networks, multiple regions, and a hybrid infrastructure that we support today for our application teams. Uh, this complexity is the reason why we've ended up down this route and using tools like Get, uh, patterns like GitOps and tools like Flux and Kubernetes to power our infrastructure. These helped solve problems that are around this complexity. And to tell you guys a bit more about that complexity and how we're using these tools to, to, to manage that complexity, I'd like to pass it over to Gordon for, for a bit more on that front. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Next slide. Okay. So um, the goal here is to use GitLab as the single source of truth for everything that's being deployed. This includes networking, Kubernetes itself, uh, our common or baseline services uh, that we'll talk about, and applications that teams at Kessel Run deploy. It also includes maintaining the appropriate access to the cluster itself, as well as applications that are deployed in it. One common factor in all of this is the use of Flux. Next slide. Okay, so why Flux? There is some measure of additional security which fits in nicely with our DevSecOps model. Nothing outside the cluster can update what is running in the cluster. Flux verifies and will reject any Git commits that are not signed properly. This prevents unauthorized code from being applied. Obviously, we have a full audit history of everything that is applied to a cluster via Git. And we eliminate the configuration drift that can happen when you let folks manually apply or tweak things in the cluster that are running in the cluster. Uh, next slide. Okay, starting with infrastructure, we are using cluster API to manage the deployment of workload clusters themselves. Now cluster API is a Kubernetes project that provides declarative APIs for managing the lifecycle of their worker clusters. We have management clusters that are responsible for the worker clusters deployed in their respective regions. Here's a snippet of a rancher dashboard uh, that's showing uh, one of them and, and what the kind of resources that they're, they're maintaining. Um, next slide. Now, before we move on, I would like to emphasize that Cluster API does more than just deploy worker clusters. It provides no downtime, security, patching, and Kubernetes upgrades. It can change instance types. 
So it can scale workers both horizontally by scaling the number of nodes and vertically by upgrading them to use larger instance types. In addition, as a safety measure, fields in the cluster resources that could cause a cluster failure if they were changed accidentally are immutable. So it prevents that from happening. Next slide. Okay, so let's just take as an example, what happens if we want to do, if we want to deploy a brand new Kubernetes cluster? Well, we kick off a GitLab pipeline and it first runs some Terraform that creates a networking itself. If for example, we were deploying in something like AWS, this would include the VPC itself. And cluster API can actually do this step, but we wanted an easy way to encapsulate all of the best practices from our cloud team based on the various security audits they had to go through. Uh, for example, it deploys a bastion instance that's running a hardened image. It deploys endpoints that allow one cluster to talk to another one perhaps, or to talk to various internal or external services. And depending on where it's deployed, it may configure access to the environment via something like zero trust and lots of other things as well. Uh, it then reads the output uh, from Terraform, outputs from Terraform and generates the custom resources um, that, uh, when, that are required for a new worker cluster. These are committed into Git. And we have a Flux instance running in that same management cluster that will apply these new custom resources and trigger the cluster API controller to deploy them. All right, uh, and ending up in a new worker cluster. Next slide, please. Okay, so the workload cluster is up. We have a running workload cluster. Now, since we did not let cluster API deploy the networking, we did that with Terraform, it cannot automatically associate the control plane nodes and worker nodes that it created with the appropriate load balancer targets. So we have a Kubernetes cron job running in the management cluster that watches for new nodes and does that for us. Then a post workload cluster deployment hook does the following. Well, first of all, it populates some secrets in vault that we need for the new cluster. Uh, then it deploys some basic things that have to be in place before we do anything else in particular, uh, we deploy uh, Bitnami sealed secrets. We deploy Flux, you know, no surprise there. We deploy the Helm operator and we deploy a service mesh. Uh, currently this is Istio. Uh, just a quick note. So among other vault secrets that are pre-populated are the private key and signing key that the Bitnami sealed secrets controller is initialized with. This lets our follow-up processes that we'll talk about here generate sealed secrets that can be committed into Git safely for subsequent application by Flux and it's able to decrypt them successfully. All right, next slide. Okay, so let's talk about the baseline services I mentioned earlier. Uh, this part is actually kind of kicked off by a human currently because different clusters have different requirements, but it's not very involved. We have a repository that manages all of what I call, all of what I call baseline services. And to register a new cluster, we just add it to a manifest that specifies what we want to be deployed. Some examples of that may be a logging, uh, stack. This is a, a standard EFK stack based on open distro, uh, maybe monitoring. Uh, this is based on cube Prometheus stack. Uh, we can deploy various host-based threat detection agents, um, Nginx ingress, everybody needs an ingress, and potentially a lot of other things that kind of fall in this category of baseline services. That is things that aren't deployed by, by the teams themselves. When this is committed in GitLab, it kicks off a pipeline that re results in the creation of some directories in Git that are monitored and applied by Flux. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's a tiny sample of what that monitor deployment directory would look like. Um, I deleted a lot of stuff just to make it fit, but I want to emphasize that not only are we able to configure and deploy whatever Helm releases that are, re are required, but we can also handle other customizations. For example, we can do RBAC that limits the scope of what a given team can access in the cluster. And this doesn't, whether they're accessing with kubectl, uh, Rancher dashboard, or a service like uh, Kibana or Grafana. We can pre-initialize namespaces for various team applications. We can customize the appropriate host names to use based on the region for things like GitLab, the various private Docker registries that we host, uh, Nexus repositories for Helm charts and other artifacts. Basically, any resource that you want to have managed in clusters that are spread across multiple regions can be handled in a similar fashion. Um, next slide, please. This is just a tiny sample of a Flux V1 um, 
config. Uh, we're actually in the middle of upgrading to Flux V2 and the new Helm operator from the GitOps toolkit. But uh, I showed Rancher dashboard in an earlier slide. Well, one of the things it likes to do when, when it's monitoring clusters is it likes to add labels and annotations to namespaces. But if you let Flux control namespace resources in its normal fashion, it will just happily revert any changes made by Rancher. Um, so here we've kind of altered uh, the normal behavior of what we do with Flux. Uh, normally uh, what it does is when it's doing its thing, it runs all of the generator commands, concatenates their output and applies it. But the first command you see here, for example, generates nothing to standard output. Instead, it runs a script from the Flux pod that will create all of the required namespaces if they do not exist, but otherwise leaves them alone. So we're able to let up control the initial deployment of the namespaces and at the same time, let, let Rancher do its thing. Okay, next slide, please. All right, I mentioned team applications earlier. Well, we have a tool called RAD, which stands for uh, Release and Deployment Dashboard. It is our internal self-service dashboard for teams to use. So behind the scenes, RAD will generate Kubernetes manifests that are committed to a specific Git repository for a given cluster. Flux is running in the cluster, it tracks these changes and will apply them. And it's been a great help uh, with our application developers as they transition from a Pivotal Cloud Foundry to native Kubernetes deployment. Now, as part of this, we include a platform manifest, let's call it, that declares various resources that may be required by an application like databases, caching services, whatever. We have a controller running in the cluster that will uh, parse this, um, process it, and it'll deploy those uh, various uh, required resources automatically. We'll talk about it more in a sec. Uh, RAD is an abstraction point in the truest sense in that it is able to evolve from a user iteration perspective by completely abstracting the deployment environment. And soon, it will also handle deployment to our air-gapped environments. It'll package up the appropriate, art uh, appropriate artifacts It'll securely transmit them uh, to the appropriate environment and we'll be good to go over there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is a, a small example of the platform manifest that I mentioned on the previous slide. Notice on the right-hand column in the baseline dependencies for this particular app that it's asking for an instance of MySQL uh, to, and it's declared there with some, some uh, parameters. So when RAD deploys this manifest along with the other ones. The controller sees this, parses it, and will automatically deploy this and any other dependencies that are requested here. So it's very easy for teams to get up and running in uh, Kubernetes with this. Uh, I think on the next screenshot, yes, okay. So here we have a somewhat redacted screenshot that shows um, the development releases of an application we call KRID. Um, and I think on the following screenshot, if I can see it, ah, yes. This one, uh, again, redacted, which showed the production deployments, including what versions are deployed where. We can have different versions of a given application deployed in different environments, staging, production, whatever. And RAD will also report the results of, uh, of a deployment to an environment to tell you if it was successful or not. It will not only tell you that the pipeline succeeded, but also whether or not the pods came up, et cetera. Uh, and Michael, I'm gonna throw it back to you for the summary, please. Awesome, thank you very much, Gordon. Yeah, so I, I kind of want to pull it all together. You know, we kind of have a little bit of limited amount of time here and, and pull together and get to, to Q&A with, with everyone. Um, but to kind of sum up, you know, what we're doing in, in Kestron and using these technologies, uh, the, the, these GitOps patterns really do, um, you know, using technologies like Flux, really do help solve pain points with fleet and configuration management for uh, our particular problem set. You know, kind of going back to some of the slides I showed earlier, our, we, we operate in a very complex environment and, and, and I'm sure that's not new to anyone here who's on the, on, on the, on the conference, but um, these particular challenges that we face when looking at the problem space uh, and, and, and the solutions that were out there, um, the, the, the declarative paradigm that Kubernetes introduced with the, 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 the declarative patterns and controller patterns that, uh, that have, have sprung out of this project 
and influence technologies and patterns like GitOps and Flux, it really does help solve a lot of the nightmares that teams have had to solve previously in trying to manage the, this type of complexity across multiple different air gap networks and worldwide, truly worldwide infrastructure. Um, also, again, like, you know, but coming back to from a compliance perspective, being able to take our end to end configuration from our cluster uh, provisioning and our baseline services and configuration to our application teams themselves, that end to end version controlled auditability, it, it, it really helps enable organizations like ours that operate in a, in a very regulated and um, a policy driven environment to make the arguments that we're trying to make around moving quicker with more, you know, with more freedom for developers to ship application uh, applications quicker, uh, backed by technologies like this to help control and have auditing in place to understand who's introducing changes and monitor those changes as they go out through the door. Um, and lastly, the, I, you know, one of the things I'd be remiss to say is there's always a, you know, there's, there's, there's commonly a misperception about what government software engineering uh, can look like. And in the US, we have a very big Fortran problem that a lot of really smart people are having to go solve. But there are places like Castle Run and others in the Air Force and the DOD that are solving uh, very interesting, complex problems using technologies that are being hosted out of the CNCF and the Linux Foundation to help drive forward really, really interesting solutions to really, really complex problems. Uh, and with that, I really appreciate uh, you guys letting us tell you a bit more about the problems that we're solving and why these types of technologies uh, are very useful to us in solving those problems. And with that, uh, we will take questions uh, and we'll be around here for the next 10 to 15 minutes, I think. Thank you very much.